Hey everyone, Mr. Hughes here, and I hope you are all well and healthy during this crazy time. And I'm going to try something a little bit different with you guys today for 7th grade history. Uh, what I'm going to do is essentially try to do exactly what we would do in class if we were all together right now. And it's a type of lesson that you guys are familiar with, something I've done for a while, and that is giving you guys some notes and having them copy, uh, having you copy them down into your notebooks. So that's what we're going to try to do uh, today. So your goal is going to be to follow along with this video as I write some things down on a Google Doc that you should see right here, and also for you to get these notes down into your notebooks themselves. All right. So we're going to do that today, and I'll also have an assignment based off of these notes that I want you guys to do, which will be on my website as well. So what we're going to do today is, first of all, we're going to focus on the election of 1796, which is going to be pretty much the first time that the United States is going to have really a big full-time election. Uh, a little bit of a recap. So first note I'm going to write down is that George Washington refused to run for a third term. Now, there were no presidential term limits at that time. So there actually wouldn't be presidential term limits until the year 1951. Uh, from 1951 onward, uh, presidents have to obey the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution, which means that they can only serve two terms in office, two four-year terms. That's the most they can serve. Uh, back then, though, and up until 1951, it didn't matter how many term limits you wanted to run. You could run as many times as you wanted and serve as many times as you wanted. But George Washington refused to run for a third term. He was done with politics. He was fed up with it. He wanted to retire back to his farm in Virginia. So uh, the election of 1796 is also going to be a little bit different as well in the fact that multiple people can run from each political party. Let's change that people right there. We misspelled that. Multiple people are going to run from each of the two major political parties. Now, if you remember what those two major political parties are, they are the Federalists and they are the Democratic Republicans. All right. So multiple people can run from each of those parties. Now, in today's elections and what we're going to see in November of this year is there's going to be one person running from the Democrats and one person running from the Republicans in our world. But back in 1796, we could have multiple people running for the Federalist Party and multiple people running for the Democratic Republicans. Okay. And another thing that we need to keep in mind from the election of 1796 is that the highest electoral vote getter, the person who gets the most electoral votes, will obviously become president. The difference between today and back then, though, is that the second highest electoral vote getter will become vice president. So today, we usually have one candidate and a running mate or a vice president run from each party. But back then, as many people could run for president as they wanted, the person who gets the most electoral votes becomes president, and the person that gets the second highest electoral votes will be the vice president. Okay? So let's meet our candidates. First, from the Federalists, we're going to have primarily two candidates. Now, there's going to be more, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the two primary candidates per party. So running for the Federalists are going to be John Adams, who is currently the vice president. And also running is going to be a man by the name of Thomas Pinckney, who is serving as the governor of South Carolina. So the two biggest candidates out of the Federalist Party about this time are going to be John Adams, who is the current vice president, and Thomas Pinckney, who is currently a governor of South Carolina. So those are going to be our Federalist candidates. And we'll even make that look nice like that. And we'll also meet our Democratic Republican candidates. We'll also make that look snazzy as well. We're just going to scroll down here. So the two major candidates that are going to come out of the Democratic Republican Party are going to be Thomas Jefferson. And if you remember from our studies of Washington's president, he is the former Secretary of State. And also a man by the name of Aaron Burr, who is a senator from New York. So the two major candidates coming out of the Federalist Party are going to be John Adams and Thomas Pinckney. 
And the two major candidates coming out of the Democratic Republican Party are going to be Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. All right. So if you remember a little bit of a background on the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, the Federalists were primarily rich and native-born elites. They were the rich. And the Democratic Republicans were primarily the working class, the farmers. And a large portion of the Democratic Republican support came from immigrants, people from primarily France and Ireland. And usually those who came over from England, who were English immigrants, usually identified with the Federalists. So we'll get into that in a little bit. All right. So what we're going to do first off is we are going to look at the results of this election. So we're going to have Adams running, Pinckney running, Jefferson running, and Burr running. And what I'm going to do really quick, hopefully this works, is I'm going to show us a map of what the results were. All right. So hopefully on your screens right now, you're looking at a map of the United States. Obviously, everything out west, past the Mississippi, that's not our land yet. Uh, really, the only states that the United States has at this point in 1796 are the ones that are highlighted either blue or green. So the blue states are going to be the states that Thomas Jefferson won, and the green states are going to be the states that John Adams won. Now, you'll notice in some of the states, there for Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina, for example, you can see that there's like a little box inside each of those states with a one. That means that John Adams had won a, uh, an electoral vote inside of that state. So you can see that the green represents John Adams and the blue represents Thomas Jefferson. So out of each of those parties, those are going to be the two major candidates to come out, Adams and Jefferson. And what's going to happen? Well, we're going to delete this map and we're going to go back to our notes. And essentially with the election of 1796, John Adams wins. John Adams is going to be the new president of the United States. And he wins with 71 electoral votes. And as we talked about before, John Adams is also a Federalist. Okay, So if you remember from the map, the person that had the second amount of votes, the second candidate out of either of those political parties that we focused on, was going to be Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson comes in second place, and he actually comes in second with 68 electoral votes. So this is a very, very, very close election between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Only three electoral votes separated Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Also, if you remember, Thomas Jefferson, actually we'll shorten it to DR, is a Democratic Republican. Now, if we go back up here when we're done, and by the way, if I'm going too fast, feel free to pause at any time. Uh, hopefully you have that capability. If we go back here, we want to focus right here, where it says that the highest electoral vote getter becomes president. Well, we know that's going to be John Adams. John Adams is going to become the second president of the United States. And the second highest electoral vote getter becomes the vice president, which means our new lineup is going to be President John Adams, who is a Federalist, and Vice President. Thomas Jefferson, who is a Democratic Republican. We can see right off the bat that there are probably going to be problems between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. So what we have here is we have a Federalist president and a Democratic Republican vice president. It's pretty much similar to if we had a Republican president today and a Democratic vice president today. Uh, they are different parties. They are the two probably most powerful people in the country. And things are about to get a little crazy between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. The two po most powerful people in the world are on the opposite ends of the political spectrum, as it's called. They're going to have different ideas on how the world and or specifically how their country should be run. Okay. So a couple of controversies are going to happen in the presidency of John Adams. And these controversies are going to be one of the reasons why John Adams isn't really as highly regarded a founding father as he probably should be. Uh, John Adams was the only founding father who had no connection to slavery in the United States. But he's also the only founding father who doesn't have any sort of memorial dedicated to him in Washington, D.C. 
And there's a couple of reasons why historians and people look back on John Adams and aren't really a fan of his. And we're going to look as to why that is. Okay. Before we get there, though, there's something that we do want to recap regarding the presidency of both Washington and the upcoming presidency of John Adams. So under both presidencies of Washington and Adams, the United States tried establishing better relations with England. United States thought that since they were their own country now, maybe they shouldn't fight the most powerful nation on earth. Maybe they should try to at least develop some sort of working relationship with England, with Great Britain. So both uh, Washington and Adams as president are going to try to establish better relations with England. They're really going to try to make our relationship with England work. Now, if you're spending a lot of time trying to convince one country to like you, chances are you're not spending as much time with other countries trying to be friends with you or improve relations with you. So one of those countries that's going to feel like, hey, the United States is kind of not paying enough attention to us is going to be France. France is actually going to feel betrayed, especially after helping the U.S. gain their independence. So France is going to feel a little betrayed that the United States is not really giving them attention, is not trying to make an even better relationship between the U.S. and France. And one of the reasons is because Federalists, which Washington more so identified with and Adams definitely identified with, felt that a relationship with England rather than France was what was going to help the country uh, establish itself as a really, really big uh, power. Okay? So a few years before the election of 1796, specifically in 1793, France and England did what they did best, and that is start a war. So in 1793, France and England had started a war. And as we talked about, this was prior, three years prior, to the election of 1796, which meant that George Washington was still president when the French and the English started this war. So right off the bat, despite being a Federalist and despite uh, siding more so or wanting relationship with England, the U.S. declared something called neutrality, which means the United States declared, hey, we are not going to join either side in this war. We're going to have the war play out and we're going to see what happens. Now, the response really isn't going to be as good as the United States probably wanted. So France and England both had a similar response. Now, when a country declares neutrality in a war, it means that they're not going to send any troops, they're not going to fight. But usually, if a country declares neutrality, it still means that they're going to be involved in the war in somehow. And the United States is still going to be involved in this war between France and England. How? Well, the United States is still going to trade with both of these countries. So the United States is going to sell weapons and supplies to France, as well as send weapons and supplies to England. So the United States is still going to send ships across the Atlantic Ocean and sell weapons and goods to both of these sides. The United States idea is, hey, if they're fighting and need things, we should capitalize on that. We should make a little money, which probably isn't a good thing. So what happens is both France and England, but primarily France, we're going to focus just on France here, starts capturing American trading ships in the Atlantic Ocean. That. So France starts capturing American trading ships in the Atlantic Ocean. These ships were on their way to Europe, uh, either to France or England, or maybe even to other smaller European countries that weren't involved in the war, but the United States was just trading with. And France primarily, and England to a lesser extent, are going to capture these merchant ships on their way to Europe. And why, you might be asking? Well, this was essentially what's called retaliation for the U.S. not helping France in the war. France thought that since about 20 years prior, they had helped the United States gain their independence in a war, they thought that the United States was going to help them in their war against England. Since we declared neutrality, France was a little upset about that. They said, hey, we helped you. Why can't you help us? 
So France starts capturing these trading ships, and they say it because it's retaliation for the U.S. not helping France. Now, England also isn't as upset that we're not helping them, but they're going to start capturing some trading ships too. You're probably asking yourself, why? You know, if we're not helping either side, why are they upset? Well, both sides are going to capture these trading ships. What both sides are also going to do is something called impressment. Impressment essentially means forcing someone into military duty. So what's going to happen is France and England are going to take these trading ships that are filled with United States people, and they are going to force them into military duty. They're going to say, hey, you have two options. One, we can shoot you right now and dump you overboard into the Atlantic Ocean. Or if you want to live, you are going to join the French or English army. So if the French had captured one of these trading ships, they would say, you know, hey, we're either going to kill you or you're going to join our army to fight the English. And the English would say, hey, we're capturing your ship. We can either dump you in the Atlantic Ocean and you can die in the middle of the ocean, or you can join the English army and help fight the French. Now, this is going to be a problem that's going to go on for four or five years, and it's going to start in 1793, and it's going to go all the way into the presidency of John Adams. This impressment is going to hurt the relationship between the United States, France, and the United States relationship with England. But that's going to be a story for a different day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here. You're done with notes, and I'm going to have a small assignment on my website that you are to complete. All right? So thank you very much for tuning in, and I will see you next time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.